Good morning. It is 11 a.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just a few uh, announcements for you. I don't have your bulletin in front of me, but I think I've got my list proper, so it's everything. We have the Harvest Home Food Drive will be coming up. In the interest of making it easy to get the food back out, I'm going to ask that we put the food downstairs inside the door. Not in the walkway, obviously, but we'll kind of try to earmark a place to put it. If we have too much overflow, we may take it into the room, into the Sunday school room, but that'll get us a little bit quicker out the door with that. Uh, we'll, we'll be connect, collecting food for the local food pantry through November 19th, which is Harvest Home Sunday. Today, later today, uh, there is a fall hay ride and picnic at Trinity and Woodward. This is of course postponed from last week and it begins at three o'clock. We'll start loading the wagons at three and we'll have dinner at about five o'clock. So if you're just coming for the dinner, you can just come for the dinner if you like. We have a lot of outlets for crock pots, but if you are bringing something cold and you're coming for the hayride, please bring something to keep it cold in. We have ladies coffee and conversation Thursday morning at 9.30 at St. James. All ladies are invited to that. Thursday night, we have the Secret Power of Kindness book study. You can start at any time. We did chapters one and two last Thursday. And it was a really good conversation. And we just meet for an hour and a half. And actually, we were done 15 minutes early <laughs> the last time. So if you'd like to join at any point, you can. The details are online on our website. Coming up October the 8th, if you're interested, we're going to have <clears throat> service at Work Park in Ahrensburg as part of the Dutch Fall Festival at 930. Uh, they're going to have an ecumenical service, several churches involved, and it will be about an hour long service. And then I, if I'm understanding this correctly, then they will have Christian music till about noon. So if you're interested in, in going there, of course, we'll have worship here at 11 o'clock. Um, bring a lawn chair if you go to work park for that service. And a reminder, we have our charge conference seven o'clock at Spruce Town on October the 18th. I've emailed out digital copies of our um, conference booklet. I will print some because I know we have people who just don't do stuff online. So I will print a few copies to have here if you'd like to see it beforehand. I will print copies. We will have to have the booklets there that night. But members of the church are needed to come to that to vote on the package, vote on the conference packet and all of those reports. So please plan to come. Uh, we do need a couple people to man the elevator to make sure that our guests get up and down safely too. So if you're willing to do that that night, please let me know. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? That was a lot. And we have a lovely little sign for the church fall bazaar back there that a tall person's going to hang way high up on that bulletin board for me. Um, I can email one to you if you wanna print them out and take them anywhere, just let me know. And with that, I wanna draw your attention to our centering words. And it's a quote from John Frame. Everything in scripture has the force of law. What it teaches, we are to believe. What it commands, we are to do. We should take its wisdom to heart, imitate its heroes, laugh at its jokes, trust its promises, and sing its songs. We'll now have the service of the acolyte. Would you please rise, embody your spirit as you are able, and join me in the call to worship. Jesus has called us here this day. We are here, here although for some of us it was not our easy choice. Often what we say and do are very different. Help us follow us to 
Come, now is the time to worship. Continuing with the opening prayer. Loving God, we come this day to worship with so many things on our hearts and minds. We are drawn away by problems and cares. Heal our spirits, open our hearts, help us be your disciples. Amen. Would you please turn in the United Methodist hymnal to number 413 to sing together the opening hymn, A Charge to Keep I Have. A charge to keep I have, a God to grow. to reconcile ourselves to God, but to be of one mind, the mind of Christ. To be of one spirit, the spirit of God's love, and to be of one purpose as beloved people of God. We offer a portion of what God first gave to us, to be blessed and multiplied to meet need that maybe only God knows at this time. So join me as we prepare to bless the offering by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy God of infinite patience and grace. We bring our offerings today knowing that our actions too often don't live up to our intentions and aspirations. When calling ourselves Christians, we announce ourselves as followers of Christ, knowing how many times our choices have made us unrecognizable as his disciples. Yet, you wait patiently for us to find our way back to the path. May our giving this day and our living Reflect our desire to be on the path that would be recognized as faithful to the Savior, in whose blessed name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Seeing none, I know that there are things that we cannot share out loud because of the nature and the fact that we're holding it in confidence for someone, or even for ourselves. So we're going to share with God those joys and concerns that are between us and God. In silent prayer, then we will all pray together. Lord of hope and healing, you've heard the cries of our hearts. You know that we do want to serve you and yet when things get tough, when things seem rough, we buckle and cave in with a lack of faith. We, sometimes we lack the courage and strength to work for you, but you, you've reminded us that you will be continually with us and we get to place our trust in you, that your love will sustain and heal us and your grace and mercy will give us courage and strength along with joy and peace. Peace regardless of our circumstances. As we come before you this day, offering our prayers for those near and dear to us, 
Let us remember that you constantly lift and carry each of us in your love and bring us to the knowledge of your mercy and powerful love that will never leave us. Prepare us for ministry in areas of need, hopelessness, and desolation. We're called to be people of prayer, so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now that we have been reconciled to God, let us reconcile with one another by rising and passing the peace of Christ in any way that's comfortable for you. Would you please remain seated for this one as we prepare our hearts for the reading of the word and the word proclaimed by singing Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, number 361. <laughs> Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from death and make me pure, not the labors of my hands. song it shows so we've got a few different passages that we're going to be hearing today they've all got some similarity to them in that there is authority there's a theme of authority and whose authority are you under and the struggle people have to accept authority over them so we're going to start in the book of exodus chapter 17 this is verses 1 to 7 water in the rock and this is from the new american standard bible this is a word for word translation of the original language and before I begin, I'm just going to deal with my seasonal allergy nose. Okay. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, what shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa, quarreled, 
and Meribah test, or, yeah, tested. <laughs> because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? The second reading comes from Philippians, and in this, Paul is writing to the church in order to give aid and counsel to a congregation that's facing challenges, talking about what kind of mindset they need to have. They don't need to all be the same. They don't need to think everything the same, but they do need to think of certain things the same way. So hear these words. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In our final passage in Matthew, it's the day after Jesus came in and cleansed the temple. And still reeling and stinging from that public display, the religious authorities, religious authorities want to test Jesus and challenge his authority to have done so, to have challenged them. And so he's going to challenge them about just how much the authorities really know. This is Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the temple came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. He also said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now Jesus goes into the first of three parables. We're going to hear the first one today. What you're going to find is the parables are dealing with God and the chief priests and elders, and they escalate. They escalate in violence, and they do so for a reason. But we begin where Jesus began. Jesus continued, but what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first, and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him and you seeing this 
did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In other words, what would it take to change your own mind? When I think about the cleansing of the temple, I think that there were some authorities there abusing their power and trying to change the minds of not only Jewish people, but Gentile people to believe they knew better than God. Anyone who understood what the temple's purpose was would know that they were abusing their power, but they were trying to change minds about that. They weren't the minds they should be changing. Last week we heard grumbling uh, to Moses and Aaron about food, and it was a genuine need, but this was a time of training in the wilderness. This was a time where they needed to learn from whom all things come. But who did they grumble to? Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron keep saying, if you're talking to us, you're talking to God. You're not just grumbling to us, you're grumbling to God. And so they pray and ask God. Moses asks God, what should I do? God tells him what he's going to do. He tells it to them. And then they have proof positive that God intervened. Again, we're hearing about more nostalgia. They're looking back again. Why did you bring us out here? We had lots to drink back there when we were all enslaved. What kept a generation of Israel from reaching the promised land? Because eventually there's a pronouncement of judgment on these Israelites in the wilderness themselves. Idealizing the past keeps us stuck in the quicksand of selective memories that may or may not be in context and that may find us ungrateful for where we are right now. Rather than being grateful for the, for the fact that they were not enslaved in Egypt anymore, that they were on their way to a land promised to them by Yahweh, they grumbled. And because they did, an entire generation of Israel would not see the promised land because nostalgia won't get you to the promised land and nostalgia will not get us where God is leading us. When we stop pretending the past was perfect, we can walk more faithfully toward God's future because God is the perfecter, not us. And God needs them to change their minds about nostalgia as the basis for believing they've seen it all. When the reality is they have to remove all of their assumptions and humble themselves to know they do not know what's going to happen. That's the truth. I don't have a clue what's going to happen the rest of today, let alone tomorrow, next week, or next year. That's the humble truth. Could you imagine how different our mindsets would be if when we hear those people demanding that we agree that so-and-so is going to do this, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen? I think there's a reason why the weather forecast changes every day. Did you notice that? You can watch a certain day and that weather forecast for that day will change every day leading up to it. Paul writes to the church about how they're to be of one mind united in Christ. Not one person. What he's talking about is there are extroverts and introverts and agreeable people and disagreeable people. And they get to be who they are. It's just that they get to be also united in Christ. And some have strengths others have, are weak in. And some have weaknesses that others are strong in. And together, they are stronger together. That's why we say we're better together. Because as a team, you are. And God knows this. And that they are to be selfless. Not to think less of oneself, but think of yourself less. And please God by taking second place. Allowing the needs of others to take the priority of not being a my way or the highway person, but saying, what is it that you need so that you can be comfortable? How can I make your day better? He's reminding them how Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And then the final passage is about authority. Whose authority are we under? Our actions and our inactions, our words and silence prove in whom we have greater faith. Therefore, who we give authority over us. In recent years, it became necessary for anyone who would serve the pulpit in the United Methodist Church and in other denominations and, and, and all around the world to be vetted fully. 
because there is a presumption of power and authority given to someone serving the pulpit. The chief priests and elders had that presumed, perceived power and authority. They were acting on God's behalf. They were acting on Jesus' behalf. And unfortunately, there have been occasions when a leader decided the church serves them. So it's good to remember that authority has an impact on how we serve others. And the impact is felt most greatly in the very moment that you have a split second to make a decision that could alter your life or the lives of others. The most excellent example is the movie U-571. Anybody ever seen this war movie, U-571? In it, they have, the U.S. Navy has captured a German U-boat and it is damaged, so they're trying to get it to the safe waters of a British harbor. Smartly and wisely, they dress in German clothing. And on the deck of the U-boat is Lieutenant Tyler and three seamen, including Ronald Parker. Ronald Parker is the one who mans the flat gun. And while they're out there on lookout trying to get this damaged vessel into safer waters, a German plane appears and starts circling the U-boat. Now, they're just circling, and Lieutenant Tyler says, we are dressed as Germans. It's a German pilot. He doesn't see anything out of the ordinary here. Wave. One of the other seamen, who is not nearly as composed, says, you want me to do what? You want me to wave? He didn't have a whole lot of faith in his authority. But they did. But then... The plane changes course and takes an attack posture and flies low and straight at them. The sailors are convinced they're about to die and they tell Parker, shoot the plane. Now, Lieutenant Tyler had told him, whatever you do, don't shoot, don't shoot the plane. But now he's being shouted at by the other seamen. Shoot it down, shoot it down. The lieutenant is back there. Hold your fire, hold your fire, get your hands off the gun. And you see in this scene, he's putting his hands on the gun, takes them off, puts them on, grips it harder, takes them off. And the music gets louder and louder, and the plane gets closer and closer. In those moments, Lieutenant, or Parker rather, is wrestling in his mind whose authority is he under? His friends? Lieutenant, or yeah, Lieutenant Tyler? Or himself. Now, if you want to see the movie and you don't want me to ruin the scene for you, it won't ruin the movie. Go like this. Okay. It just went over him and went away. It's messing with him. Lieutenant Tyler's instincts were spot on and trustworthy. But the only seaman under his command who was truly under his authority was Parker, who did not shoot. That was how the chief priests and elders saw Jesus cleansing that lone section of the temple designated for non-Jews to come in and to pray. It was an attack on them. The Gentiles who would come in and pray in the temple court believed in Yahweh, the God of the Jews, but they knew they weren't included in their covenant. But they had faith, and faith is what always justifies a person, not the law. Jesus is God, remember. And God has seen what the Jewish leaders had done to that area that was meant for you and me, Gentiles. God, in the form of Jesus, understood that these chief priests and elders had no regard whatsoever for the Abrahamic promise that he would be the father of many nations, not limited to the nation of Israel, many nations. He even sent out his disciples to many nations. And so Jesus calls them out, quoting Jeremiah and Isaiah in the passage Mark eleven seventeen, 17. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers? Who was being robbed? Those who were supposed to have access we're being robbed. All nations, not just yours, you disobedient jerks. 
That's my interpretation. He didn't actually say that, but he was angry and rightfully so. God intended that space to be used in a certain way. He intended for those chief priests and elders with authority to be exercising the grace and mercy to make sure that those things which God has said should be used a certain way are used a certain way. He wanted relationship with all nations by grace through faith and those sons, the chief priests and elders who were expected to offer that grace were outright disobeying God. And now the chief priests and elders, when they saw Jesus in the temple, they thought, oh, we've got an opportunity to confront that Jesus and find out who made him think he could come in here and tell us stuff like that. Only Jesus turned the tables on them, responding to their question with a question, the answer of which reveals the answer to their first question. They knew what the answer meant, but it wasn't what they expected. Jesus' authority, John the Baptist's authority comes from heaven and not a human. They can deal with humans. They deal with humans. You'll see how that goes in the next two parables. The, the parable is hard for them to hear because it's dealing with them. And it's saying, you talk a big game, but you're not doing your job. And the father knows. Jesus' parable is about a father going to his children who have the privilege of working in the vineyard. And the first son comes off as rude and rebellious. Sound like anyone he's talking to directly? Is their misuse of the temple not rude and rebellious? I will not go. But he changes his mind. You could say that he changes how he feels about his personal disobedience to the father. He thinks again. He throws away all of the previous assumptions. He reconsiders, and he goes to work. He does the will of the father. The younger son has the appearance of obedience, saying with his mouth all the right words. He says he will. But with his body, he says no. And he didn't change his mind. That was his decision all along. His body knew the truth. Because of what he said with his mouth, he thought he was okay with the father. As far as he knows, I'm working. But with his body, he's disobedient and he's not fooling the father. And that's the point Jesus makes. He's fooling himself. The chief priests and elders are used to their words having all the persuasive power necessary to accomplish whatever it is they need to accomplish. But hearing that the Father not only hears what they say with their mouths, but sees whether or not they follow through might have been pretty tough to hear. Among that group, there might have been some first son people and some second son people because we know that some were moved, like Nicodemus, wanting to know more. What would it take to change their minds about ensuring the Gentiles have access to the space that God designated for them? If the temple represents the kingdom of God, who will the chief priests and elders stand beside in the kingdom? Everyone that they deem worthy? Everyone God deems worthy. We may be, we may be far more surprised by who's not there than by who is. Jesus came to reconcile all people to God, sending out disciples to all nations. No more division, no more categories. We've heard that part of scripture where Jesus says there's no more this and that. There's no more that and this. There's no more who's he, what's it's and other who's he, what's it's. It's we're united in Christ. We're one in Christ. He did not say you lose your identity. He did not say you're no longer those things. He said, we are now a we. We're we and us, the body of Christ. The only categories that God is concerned with comes much, much later, and it's faithful servant this way, unrepentant, hypocritical sinner that way. Hence, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going to the kingdom of heaven before they are. So let us pray. How quick we are to say yes to you, Lord, with our mouth. And then we turn around 
and forget our bold words of commitment in our bodies. Paul struggled with it. I don't do what I want to do, and what I want to do, I don't do. We really want to serve, but we're very weak and easily drawn away by cares and fears, especially a fear of missing out. We pledge ourselves to working for your kingdom, but found, find ourselves pulled this way and that way by other demands on our time and our energy and just resistance sometimes and just difficult people. And <coughs> Forgive us when we so quickly drop our commitments to serving you. Heal our spirits and give us the bold courage to truly be your disciples inside and out, as well as inside the church and out. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Would you please open the United Methodist hymnal and turn to page 13? Does everyone have their communion elements? Is anyone in need of those? Very good. Please join with me under the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, you created us from dust. You call us to live in your image and to be of one mind. Even when we grumbled and complained and we argued and fought, you kept calling us to unity and love. Even when we neglected your teachings and turned away from your call, you kept inviting us back into your vineyard of mercy and grace. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. In the fullness of time, you sent Christ Jesus to call us anew to abundant life, compassionate love, and unity with you and your people. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. The body of Christ calling us to be children of God. Amen. The love of Christ poured out for us, calling us to love as we are loved. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you now have set your servants free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of ours have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see. Blessing and honor and glory are yours now and forever as we celebrate as the saints below with all those saints above. Amen. Would you please rise in body or spirit to sing our closing hymn, number 370, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. said yes to serving God. 
but they said no to Yahweh's direction. And what they're learning is that God knows our hearts and knows our spirits and sees our struggles and forgives our weakness and gives us another chance. Know that it is in God's healing love that you live and move and have your being. And be glad that God is always with you. Until next time, share the spirit, encourage others in Christ, go forth to give God's love and encouragement to the world because the world needs it. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen.